to the end of another season if you can believe it we got to the end of season one of discovery then we got to the end of season one of uh the original series and now here we are at the end of season two of discovery and even stranger is that if you were to add all the episodes of discovery together you would get about the same amount of season as you got in the original series of Star Trek, because it was like 30 episodes long or something, and season two is well on its way to doing the same thing of the original series. So there we are, and we're at the end of it and here to discuss it. My name is Matt, coming to you from Austin, and coming to us from Houston is my brother Ken. Say hello, Ken. Peace and long life. There we go. Well, we are the Brothers Trek About, and we are talking about the season two finale of Discovery. We're there. We've done it. Uh, well, let's just start with generalizations here, Ken. What do you think of this uh, this final episode here, in general? So, you know, my my first rule, the prime directive, okay. is that any Star Trek is better than no Star Trek. Fair. But uh, there were lots of things about this finale that I found disappointing. Not oh, that they okay. were bad. Not that they were uh-huh. bad, right? I mean, it was a it was a good piece of uh, you know action adventure drama space battle, right? Okay. Yeah. The fact that there were like so many little things flying around made it more like uh, Star Wars than Star Trek. Okay. Uh, so Star Trek has always been about the big ships, you know, engaged in kind of these main battles with other big ships, not a bunch of little things flying around. Okay. And, you know, so part of this is, is like, what's in your head while you're making this, right? Right. So if, if you're thinking it's World War II, these are carriers, you come up with, with Star Wars, Right. Right, which, which is full of carriers and fighter battles, and those fighter battles were consciously taken from, you know, at points Lucas had like World War II fighter movies up, going, and then we'll do this, and then they basically copied, you know, basically shot for shot, banter, incidents, you know, the starship, you know, shooting at the fighters and the fighters dodging or whatever responding, whereas. Star Trek has been about these kind of main ships that are so powerful that, like, it would be pointless to attack them with little things. So, up until the Russo-Japanese War, big ships, battleships, were afraid of destroyers. Destroyers had torpedoes. They were cheap and plentiful, and the big ships were worried about it. So, Mm -hmm. ships like the USS Texas, just a couple of miles from where I'm sitting, were built with a bunch of secondary guns to deal with torpedoes. And then in the Russo-Japanese War, they realized, oh, we're engaging each other at such huge distances. And the torpedo ships, the destroyers would have to go through so many guns to get to us. It's pointless. And then we built dreadnoughts. All big gun destroyers or, uh, you know, uh, big ships, Mm -hmm. battleships. And so you get something like, you know, uh, the USS New Jersey or the Missouri. And there's no small guns. There's aircraft, anti-aircraft ships because it's World War II, but there's, they're not worried about destroyers, right? And then you get to, like, the post-World War II aircraft carrier, right? In, in which, once again, you kind of have these big fighters who are able, American ones, right, or who are able to project uh, missiles out to such a range that you can't attack the carrier, right? You can't get enemy aircraft in. You'd have to send in so many uh, aircraft to not get shot down by the uh, 
F-14s and their amazing missiles and the missiles on board ship. So if you play a game like Harpoon, you're like, you, don't, you just don't attack American carriers because it's suicide. Right. And so you're kind of back to the Star Trek world of my ships are invincible, right? Because I'm projecting power out to such a range. And what we got here was we, you know, we dispense with all of this Star Trek, like how, you, how do you fight a battle, including the way we fought Battle of the Binary Stars. Mm-hmm. And we did something entirely different. Why? Because it's cool? I guess so. I mean, it, it was cool. Yeah. I, it, it was fun to look at. But, you know, afterward, you're like, that's not how Star Trek or Star Trek fights battles. Right? So that right. was one big disappointment that, that they chose to do that. Well, I think, too, they were just kind of upping the scale, right? They are like, well, this is the finale, so let's just get as many, like, ships going as we can. And, oh, no, look what, uh, you know, the AI has done, controlled, right. they've created these little mini guys to fight our little mini guys. But why did we have little mini guys? I mean, if, uh, presumably we've always had all these little mini guys, and we just right. don't use them. And, and like, why? And if they're, if they're useful... And maybe they would only really be useful, in, you know, fighting his stuff. But I would have rather that, like, other ships show up. Like in Battle of the Binary Stars. Right. Who, like, you don't get their names. You, you know, someone just says the name of the ship. You know, oh, the, the New Orleans is here. Oh, look, there's the Independence. Um, oh, the Independence has been taken out. You know, this, this kind of stuff. And, and we focus on our two crews, right? Yes. Well, that doesn't... That doesn't then help the end when they have to tie everything up in a really nice bow and say, like, oh, we can't talk about this anymore. Which is my second, you know, real disappointment, right? Okay, hit me. So, you know, apparently the reason they're going 950 years in the future is they just found it too difficult to write in a, in a canonical world, right? Right. But mm-hmm. the problem is, if you want to fill your show with characters like Pike and Number One and Sarek and Spock's sister and Spock... Yeah, you're going to have some difficulties. So why yeah. don't you take your original crew and just wander off to some place that's not filled with cannon? That's all you have to do. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. even with, with Pike, you know, Pike's basically got like three or four points at which we know what he's at and what he's doing, right? Yeah. Other than that, it's, it's a characterization question, right? Yeah. You want, you want him to be the authentic character. But like, even when they changed, he was the guy who came up with uh, Engage. But they switched him to hit it. And, you know, that's fine. Because, like, how many times is he? I think he says it three times in, in the cage, Engage, right? Yeah. I mean, he never said hit it. But we do live in a more informal in a world than the 60s. You don't imagine a captain going, you know, hit it. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, Jean-Luc Picard is not saying hit it. Yeah. <laughs> But Riker could have, right? If yeah, Riker said absolutely. hit it, you, would, yeah. you wouldn't go, what? Yeah. So the whole, you know, needing to, to do this, needing to go into the future rather than just, you know, so that they can tell new stories, I think is, is weak sauce. It's, mm-hmm. it's uh, doing, you know, what they did with Voyager. Oh, we, you know, we, we can't just have a ship, just do ship things. We've got to, like, do something weird with it. We got to send it so it can't communicate to get back that sense of being alone. Mm-hmm. When all they really needed to do is do what they did in the, in, in the original series. You know, you send a message, but it's going to take time because we're way over here, right? Yeah. We're not, we're not like 10 minutes from galactic, you know, he, you know, headquarters or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Starbase one. You, know, you don't, you don't necessarily have to go crazy to tell a new story. You just have to not be standing around in the middle of, you know, on Vulcan Main Street. Yeah. Going, how, how come we can't tell new stories? We're, we'll go someplace new, do something different, without necessarily having to, okay, by new, we're going crazy new. Yeah. So I kind of felt that was a cop-out. That being said, of course, any Star Trek is better than no Star Trek, so I'm going to watch it, and I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. It's just going to be like, you know, oh, well. Yeah. They could have stayed where they were and done interesting things. There are plenty of people and or peoples that we've basically either only met once or twice or we've never met. And they could have gone running around, you know, or or meeting new people. 
that we've never met and yeah. we'll never meet again. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I was thinking that, like, as an example, like, uh, you know, the Romulans, we couldn't, you know, there'd be no Romulans because the Kirk is supposedly the first encounter they've had in a million years. You know, and so it and it also seemed like there were lots of firsts when it came to the Enterprise. So I think that that's kind of one of the things that they were really like trying to shy away from is like, well, how do we get away from, we know in this episode, it's the first time they met a blah, 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 or this time that they dealt with a society that does blank. So I think that that's kind of the stuff that they were talking about. Just go the other way. You you don't like follow them, which is right, what they, right, they're right. doing. They, fo <coughs> they followed existing canon rather than just turning left when Enterprise turned right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's true. I mean, it's not like they're not going to encounter new people in, you know, a thousand years in the future. Right. So you just encounter new people here. You don't need to go off in crazy, you know, crazy land. Yeah. No, that's true. Um, uh, that was my second thing, though. I was going to actually ask you that question. Um, the first thing I was going to say, though, is that uh, I like this episode a lot. Um, I think that the scale is epic, which I think is part of the reason they did that thing that you don't like of adding all of the ships and everybody just blasting everybody. It was um, epic. It was fun to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, it, was, I, it was emotionally satisfying. Yeah, absolutely. Right. The, the stakes were high, and yet, you know, the struggle against it and all the things they had to do, that was satisfying. Yeah. I enjoyed uh, it. Yeah, I mean, the effects, just to throw it out there, were also amazing in this episode. I also called it right that uh, Spock would get stuck in the shuttle and not be able to get rescued by the disco and had to go back to the Enterprise as we know Canon tells us we have to do so there is that uh, also being this far into the future Burnham's mother is technically still in play I mean you know as you've stated with time travel anything is possible we never know what's going to happen uh And in response to everything that you just said, I also said, uh, you know, that being able to get away from canon, which I know, you know, like you said, you could just go in the other direction. However, when you clear canon completely out of the way, it gives you a much more open world, right? So, um, you know, it's like when the original Star Wars EU got the got the boot because they're like, no, we're going to make movies in that time era, so none of this can can matter anymore. So, like, what else is canon between? The cage, and where no man has gone before. If you're if you're not involving Pike, Spock, Kirk, any of the characters from you know the uh, the original series, and you just go that way instead of this way, right? I don't think you'd have a lot of canon. Yeah. I mean, you know, so you you wouldn't necessarily want to do a whole lot of Klingon stories. Mm -hmm. If you were going to do a Romulan story, you'd have to do what Enterprise did, and you did not know that you encountered the Romulans. Right. You'd just be like, well, that was weird. I wonder what happened there. And the Romulans are all like, hee -hee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you know, you could do Tholian stories. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of, of other kinds of encounters you could be having. You could do, yeah. like, Gorn. You know, it's not like there's a whole bunch of Gorn canon. That also we can't. true. We just have to, like, not make it so that we don't end up being befriending the Gorn and the Gorn become our new allies. And you're like, right. well, how, how do they end up fighting each other in the arena? Well, you know, there's... There's, there's so uh, much to do. And there's, yeah. like, all these... It's space. It's infinite, right? I mean, yeah. you can just encounter all new kinds of... Which is what they did in the original series, right? They just made stuff up. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fact that they invented canon was an accident in the original series. Yeah. And they just, like, occasionally double back on something and go, oh, look, we could reuse this. Isn't that clever? We've never done that before. <laughs> Nobody's done that. That's, you know, let's just let's do that because it's different. Yeah. But they were just, like, going out and planning of the week, making stuff up. And you could do that with some kind of, you know, big arc, right? Yeah. I read an interesting article today that was talking about the uh, what they call the reset button, which like at the end of the original series, they constantly would have to do, right? We just, okay, we're at the end of this episode. Now the next episode's going to begin like the previous episode didn't happen. And so uh, they were talking about that as it related to the next generation. 
obviously that's we know that that's very episodic and then how you know ds9 basically sort of got to play with it a little bit and but what apparently they were dealing with is it was all coming down from Paramount. Paramount was saying, like, we want anybody to be able to watch this, up, you know, tune right. into this series at any point and see what they're missing without having felt like they've missed, you know, three seasons of episodes that, you know, they'll Which never see. Which is a technology again. issue, right? Right. So if you want to put these in syndication and have people to be able to just sit down and just watch an episode, then they have to be episodic. Yeah. But, you know, in the world of today where it's streaming and you marathon shows. Yep. You don't need to do that. No, totally true. And that's what they were saying is how like how great it, th this season was for that reason, you know, just because it was just the one big arc and just telling one big story. <clears throat> all right, to the episode. First of all, the first thing I wrote down was Michelle Yeoh is still on the ship. Yeah, and she's going She's going to get off in some kind of weird way. or I guess. Or they cloned her or something. I don't know. That was another idea I had. Or it turns out her show also takes place. <laughs> I guess it's from now. Yeah. That'd be weird. Section 31, 950 years later. Well, I, I bet she got off the ship. I bet she, there was some kind of last minute teleport. That's going to be like the first thing we see. You know, it'll be last time on... This brand new series that's had this, this you're watching the premiere of, yeah, and yeah. she's like, you know, touches her thing on the belt, and she zips away, and then you see Discovery go off in the future, and she's you know on one of the Section Thirty One ships that doesn't get blown up and scoots off in the night. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so coming off the emotional end of last week's Biggs episode, we are suddenly thrust into all action all the time. Uh, we see the ships preparing, you know. Uh, Lots of running. What's that? Lots of running. Yes, 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 exactly. Um, suddenly exactly. Uh, fit. Leland shows up and says to uh, says to Giorgio, like, uh, hey, you know, give us your stuff, blah, blah, blah. Giorgio says back, uh, looks like we have the technical advantage, 200 ships to year 30. And he says, count again. And suddenly they merge into the the things, which was... Transformers uh, happen, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, I thought that was a of Autobots. He was crazy. <laughs> suddenly our strategy looks so bad. This episode, again, is directed by Olatunde Osansami. Uh, same guy who did uh, Calypso again. Right? We mentioned this before, but it never really connects to calypso at least not yet weird opening except that that was a teaser that discovery ends up way 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 in the future <laughs> well i guess that's true except that he still finds it at some point uh opening teaser to this episode is really super long as we've no as we saw that was that whole setup and everything oh. up until you the know the transformers calypso, all moment he does with, he, i mean he it interacts with the sphere data but he just dances with it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly oh fred astaire uh, I, I didn't write this down, but I think one of the reviews I was reading, and it might have been a Den of Geek, said, uh, wouldn't that be interesting if that, if what we finally see in Calypso, that that AI starts to grow in the new Enterprise so that they actually start getting some kind of like crazy AI that's helping run the ship? That'd be interesting. Back from the opening credits, we go right into the battle. Super FX shots, you know, like blasters going everywhere or phasers. Uh, Poke, Queen Poe comes in to save the day. She realizes it takes two shots to uh, from the shuttles to simultaneously hit the drones. So now their attack essentially is cut half and cut in half, basically. But at least now they have a plan, so that's good. <laughs> Reno has a great scene when the uh, crystal is charged. Uh, Saru's like, uh, Tilly, you go with her. And she's like, in case, he means in case, case one of us dies. And he's like, dead. go, yeah. go, go. And she's like, get off my ass, sir. I mean, get off my ass, sir. When you think about uh, it, they're all commanders, right? Right, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, Burnham, Saru, and, and uh, she, they're all commanders. So in one sense, she, they pro she probably does think of them as like, we're all equals here. Yeah, and then yeah. she realizes, oh, you're in the big chair right now. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it's great. Which yeah. also uh, sets up a really interesting thing as far as next season goes, because 
since Pike didn't name him captain, we can imagine that, not that there will be a void necessarily, but it's like, at, at this point now, since there's no Starfleet or anything else, you know, how do we deal with ranks now? Does it even matter? Are we just now one big plucky, you know, group of friends all, all in this together? I mean, how does it work? So that's, I'm sure that'll be an interesting thing that'll come up. Well, I think, you know, you could end up with, with like a war council, right? Uh-huh. In which you get the three commanders and a few key lower officers who come in and like have to make decisions because not one, there's no one of those three commanders who's the captain. Yeah. It's the Picard era of uh, starting right there where you get the entire command crew up into one big table and sit around and talk about your best options. Well, that's what Kirk did, right? He just there's always a had... He always had McCoy and Spock and yeah, 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 yeah. Scotty was there. and or Sulu, yeah. Or Aunt yeah. Sulu. So uh, they build the suits. They get the suit going. Uh, Stamets gets hurt in the process. They get him to sick bay. Culber is there and he realizes that uh, he's decided to stay aboard after all. You know, I was thinking... It's just that this whole like quick wrap up of this storyline didn't feel right for me. And I thought the part of the reason is it's just because it's it was such a long, prolonged story. Right. Yeah. It was like, oh, well, they won't. They da, 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 happens all season long. So that then suddenly when they're given like what felt like 45 seconds to suddenly wrap up the, you know, wrap up their storyline. It's like, why did they just do it last episode? They had the one thing where he's like, I'm going to the Enterprise. Just wrap it up there. You don't need this like silly. He's getting hurt. And then, uh, and it's not even him getting hurt that makes Culber realize because that would have been fine, right? You know, he like sets up like Culber's like, oh, now that I've seen you hurt, I realize I can't live without you. I don't want you anywhere but near me. Blah blah blah. That would have been at least be sweet. But this just like, oh, never mind. I happened. Just decided I was going to stay on board. After I don't think all it was that. that. I think it was sure one of felt those, like it when it when it came, you know, time to to you know pull the trigger on what it, the separation. He's like, I decided I want I don't want to separate. Yeah. And that's what he said. I mean, I felt that was like that. That thing is likely to happen. This is the running back to the airport, right? Yes, yeah, which we yeah, see yeah. in a million. And it, it, which we saw, uh, which we actually saw Michael do. <laughs> she was like, I had to give one last kiss to Tyler in the last episode. Yeah. So, I, and I didn't feel that was implausible. Or I do agree that's something that they could have resolved. But you know, then you have like the whole building tension problem, right? Right. That they, you know, they were building, 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 building climax, as opposed oh, yeah. to building, building. Oh, we resolved something over here. Building. Stick. We still building over here. Still building over here. Yeah, I guess that's true. That is true. Uh, along that same storyline, uh, Bert that the movie said this about that. Stamets is gravely injured, resulting in a touching, if unmotivated, reunion between him and Culber, who's decided that Paul is his home, and he's not going to transfer to the Enterprise after all. I don't recall what it was that changed his mind. This scene l- rings less true than the surprisingly well-observed falling out between them. I was like, oh, well, that puts perfectly into words all the things I was, I was thinking about. Except that people do that all the time, right? It's yeah. because everyone is always of more than one mind, right? Right. And when confronted with the, well, this is it, we're, you know, I'm getting on the plane, mm-hmm. you're like, I don't want to leave. But then give us that scene. You know, like, give us the scene of Culver, like, about to step aboard this sp- shuttle or, like, you know, packing up his stuff and realizing this is silly, you know. And then when he goes to find Stamets, he's already injured. And then, you know, I, I don't know. I just felt like one more, like, scene would have been great. Which brings up something I've been thinking about this whole season, which is, like, are there plans to put the show on TV? Like, why are we sticking sticking to like the you know one hour format? You know, it's interesting. It's like, especially in a big episode like this, why not make it an hour fifteen to make sure you get all of those moments? Hour twenty three. Yeah, whatever. Just some random amount matter? of time. Yeah. It's funny because in these, which by the way has been very similar in its lead up. Sorry, Game of Thrones happening this sunday right it's going to be a huge episode it's going to be the battle for winterfell it's going to be this whole big thing i won't give any spoilers for people who haven't seen it yet but it's the last two episodes have been doing what the last episode of enterprise did of kind of just like okay we're setting it up we're letting you know all the pawns are in place we're gonna do it and then 
So then this episode, where all the last two episodes have been 50, 58 minutes, the next episode's 82 minutes long. You know what I mean? Because it's going to be a huge battle. People are for sure going to die because it's Game of Thrones. So it's like, give us the time to like make sure that everything you're doing rings true. Everything else I felt worked because they did spend a lot of time with Spock and Michael and all those scenes I thought were really great in this episode. I but also again, wonder to what extent an issue that you brought up over and over again as part of your formula for the original series is the budget, right? Yeah. So they may have had a whole lot of budget for going long. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's probably true. Uh, again, but what's an extra 30 seconds of seeing, you know, Culber, like, about to step on the shuttlecraft and then turn around and, you know, do his run back to the airport or whatever. Yeah. Or you have Just one saying. of those where he hands hands the guy his bag and the bag gets put in the, the, the large <laughs> slot. He's like, no, no, I, I want that back. I need that back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the guy's like, what? Exactly. what are you doing? No, no, no. I... <laughs> uh, and it sp- runs back. And you're like, oh, we know what's going to happen. And then we have that whole scene where uh, Stambus is laying there injured and like, what's right, going to happen? Exactly. And he shows up. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, given, given more time, I would do more stuff. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of Spock and Michael, they have their first big moment in, uh, moment in the scene where she puts on the suit. He has uh, decided to take a shuttle and lead her through the battle. Stay in my wake, he says. Uh, it's a very sweet scene. She's like, no, you can't go. You got to stay here. And he's like, nope, I got to do this. I'm not going. You're definitely not going out there without me, basically. Uh, then they touch each other, giving each other the Vulcan hand salute, which, of course, you know, we, we get the flashback to them doing it originally. Bond yeah. between brother and sister are truly re I wrote. So then this this brought up this thought, which is, since Spock has now learned all these important lessons from Michael, which we hear about at the end, old wounds can be rehealed, he has also learned. So why doesn't he ever do it with Sarek? That's the question. You know, it's a it's very interesting. Again, this is one of those like little weird canon things that's right. like, it's fudged a little bit. Well, you know, so Sarek. I think what you'd want to do, and you could do this if we got a Pike Spock, you know, continuation yeah. series, right? Is you have a like one or two times where Spock tries to broach that. He tries to, you know, and, and is and Sarah just makes it unpleasant, and they end up it's unresolved and angry at one another. We had lots of that between Burnham and Spock, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, up till uh, just recently. Yeah. So you you do some of that and. You know, at at the end of season one of this thing, you know, you'd have some conversation between Amanda and Spock, and it'd be like, uh, I just can't, you know, figure out how to open things up with with yeah. my father. And you know, she'll say something like, Well, you know, he really, you know, this and that, and yeah, but no, and, you know, I think I think things are just better the way they are. And you're like, okay, there you go. Because when we get when we see Spock. Oh man, we might have talked about this last week. But when we see Spock and Sarek next in that ba- Journey to Babel, um, or Babel, uh, you know, it seems like it's it's Sarek who's keeping keeping him at arm's length as opposed to the other way around. Right, and so you'd want to resolve it so that 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 exchange would make sense, mm-hmm. right? Where there, yeah. where and Sarek does say something like, "This is how Spock wants it," so I'm gonna. You know, do it that way. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I like that. And so you just could play that out a little bit more if you were going to do a... And again, there's going to be no progression. There's no advance, right? There's no arc. Nothing happens. We just get to see him try and fail once or twice and go, yeah, that's why they never quite got where they were going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too stubborn and too whatever. And Yes. Uh, so then we get my next favorite shot, which is Michael jumping out into space, being followed by the shuttlecrafts. That sh- shot was amazing. Uh, super props to everybody involved in that one. Leland is aboard the Enterprise now, suddenly. So Yo and Nan decide they're going to go after him, you know. Oh, and if you're... oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, he jumps on the Discovery. So uh... Michelle Yo, I wrote Yo, not Georgia. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Giorgio and Nan decide to go after him. Now, remember, Nan was originally on the Enterprise crew and came over with Pike, but I guess she's Team Disco now, huh? Uh, 
then we get the undetonated torpedo, which ends up in the Enterprise section, which both Reno and Michael saw about the future and doesn't really anything. In fact, Reno seems to have come out with her, you know, time with the, the, the crystal, time crystal fine. It seems like yeah. nothing's going to happen to her, you know. So we so nothing happens basically because of the torpedo thing, except for you know, uh, except for you know them having to go and di- try and dismantle it. <laughs> I also wrote Michael freaks out as we go to commercial <laughs> 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 because okay, so the thing about Sonequa, which I've noticed, right, and I'm not taking anything away from her. I think she's a great actress, and this show has just proved it. But in, and she does a lot of acting with her eyes, right. And how wide they go, like so. When it's like something's, ama- you know, something's either like uh, scary or amazing, they go really wide. And depending on how wide they go, depends on how intense or, you know, the thing's supposed to be. So when you get a moment like this, her eyes are just like, her balls are basically popping out of her eyes at that point. It's crazy, you know. And it, I mean, you know, I always are the pathway to the soul, right? So if you're going to be a good actor, boom, that's the way to do it. If something sad's about to happen, you can see him just start to well up. Her eyes get really glassy and wet. I mean. She's just great. I've noticed it. I've noticed. I've been obviously. I've been watching her since Walking Dead. So I saw many seasons of that. I've seen a few seasons, you know, of this already. She's great. Commercial. Back at it. <laughs> uh, the Enterprise is blowing up all over the inside. That's bad. Uh, so let's talk about this undetonated torpedo thing because we see by the end of this episode the damage that this thing does. It's like crazy amount of damage. And yet this right. one blast door by the turbo lift is going to I take know. the impact. So this is one of those, it's rule of cool to have Pike there and and look at it, but it makes no sense whatsoever. No. Yeah. Right? Because apparently this black blast door is made of indestructium. And, uh... <laughs> and the rest of the Enterprise <laughs> isn't. Nor yeah. anything else on the inside of it. There are no other doors. Protected. Right. And he's just standing there looking at it. You'd think he'd be blinded. I mean, this is a matter yeah, exactly. antimatter explosion. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's cool they have that moment. And yeah, no, absolutely. It, it'd be less cool to see him running, like, down a corridor while, like, fire comes up behind him. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right? You even, that. even if that, those were secondary fires, right, you'd still be, like, not as cool as if, you know, he's there with Cornwell at the last moment observing her heroic <clears throat> but yeah it's, it's pure like you know we talked about this before what makes sense for the story and what makes sense for characters yeah like what makes sense in a kind of real world where you walk away from it and you're like hmm that makes no sense at all <laughs> or you know you're like oh but it was cool to have you know him witness this thing and be with her as she yeah. so you know, we know that Pike does the same thing at the end of his career, right? Yes. He'll make this heroic thing. But I also thought, and this is where I'm going to bring up that uh, a video that uh, listeners may have seen. It's on, on YouTube. You just uh, put in Obi-Wan tells Luke about his father. And there's this great you know, thing where they cut between episode four and the... Um, my father was a spice out of spice. No, that's what your uncle wanted you to, you know. Yeah. He was a, a good friend and the best pilot, you know, this whole thing. And you cut back between the prequels. And uh, and it's great because you're kind of in the head of Alec Guinness yeah. as, as he goes back to being uh, Ewan McGregor and interacting with who we know to be Darth Vader. And yeah. he was killed by a pupil of mine. And then, you know, he's, it's cool. It's very cool. Yeah. And you could have ended the series with, you know, with like, uh, it, had they not gone 950 years in the future, with Michael Burnham doing the same thing to, like, heroically save the ship, save the crew. And yeah. that's why nobody talks about her, because she's basically been dead for however long. Yeah. Not that Spock ever talked about his wife or his brother, Cybok, or his family when they show up and it's like, wait, wait, that's your family? What the, <laughs> you know? How about Mike a has a up? family? Yeah. <laughs> we picked your homeworld already. You didn't tell us about your parents. Right. So, but you, you could have had the exact same thing where, like, at the when Michael Burnham dies at the end of the series, 
right? Saving yourself. You'd have Spock. You know, I'd love to see the scene, right? The exact same scene where he's in at the end of Wrath of Khan. He's going putting on the suit, and you know, and he's thinking about how this is what Michael Burnham did, right? She saved oh, yeah, the ship, yeah. and this heroic thing died, but that sacrifice. And then, you know, you could also put in some Cornwell, right? Yeah, Admiral Cornwell did it. And, you know, it's it's what we do. It's what we do here in Starfleet. We get it done. Yeah. But we've, we've I... lost all. Can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away from us. Uh, let's see. So, uh, so at this point, uh, at least in my writing here, at this point, uh, uh, number one and, and Cornwell are just running down there to, uh, check on it, make sure everything is okay. It's at this point now where Pike's like, Hey, uh, why don't we go ahead and deploy all the R2 droids to go fix the hull? Why did they wait so long? That's my next question. I'm like, they've been getting killed for like, you know, 15 minutes at this point. It's like, oh, yeah, now we'll do it. Now's a good time to deploy all the R2 units. That's cool. And they get up there and they just start fixing things, right? You yeah, know, I know, They're right? waiting like, yeah, we're not going to fix anything but this. Right, just going to exactly. wait for this. No, they're like, oh, look, there's all kind of like rubble up here and debris and... I know, it was crazy. A little dents in there. We're going to like pop these dents here. Uh, then suddenly the Klingon ship arrives with the Ba'ul fighters. Uh, suddenly more threads are being wrapped up through Sister Serana is there. Tyler is with the Klingons. We will fight to preserve our future, says uh, Laurel. And then she says it's a good day to die, which was super yep. cool. Uh, but then the Calvary gives Spock an idea. He says, Burnham, you were the one who placed all of the signals. They were all to lead to this moment. You've got to go back before you can go forward, he says, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And then we had this weird thread that sort of came in and out of this season. And somebody pointed out that may have been because they changed showrunners. Who knows? But that uh, uh, about her and her faith, Burnham and her faith. And so she says to him, hey, you want me to take a leap of faith? And Spock says, uh, oh, yes, I do. But only one that is logical. He says. <clears throat> so then the hand-to-hand -hand combat fights, Leland and Nan and Giorgio. Uh, it covers many decks over this episode. Nan is knocked out in this really cool episode, or, the, or uh, this really cool scene where the gravity's in flux and they're fighting all over the walls and stuff. It's Fred Astaire dancing around the room, right? <laughs> yes, it sure is. And, and so Charlie and I have Filmed watched... the same way. Exactly. Charlie and I have watched that Fred Astaire thing, right? Uh-huh. And, you know, she's, because she likes dancing, she's taken dance lessons. And she's like, how, how do they do that? Because you can't dance up walls. And I'm <laughs> what? like, you, what you do is you make a set that's a box, and the camera is still, but the, the, the room slowly turns, and so the actor stays upright, but now he's on the wall, now he's on the ceiling, now he's on the other wall, now he's back on the ground. So when she saw this, she knew exactly how it was done, right? Because she's <laughs> seen the Fred Astaire. Right. <laughs> love it and they did they did a nice little circle you think the gravity's out they really could be all over the place but no they they did the fred astaire circle so michael makes her her first jump as the wormhole opens that was a really cool shot the way it like you would flip from one side like it was a mirror or something or a window i don't know it's hard yeah. to describe and it also felt very uh 2001 space odyssey to me and then all the reviews basically said the same thing. It feels very 2001. And I, and I was trying to figure out myself what it was that made it feel very... The, the, the effects are very 2001. You know, it's there's the one... It's because Hal is control. There you go. There you go. But I think, too, that, like, the special effects, in, in a way, are, were very easy. I, that's not necessarily the word I want to use. Um, but, you know, there's this shot of, like, Burnham as the stars are flying by her, you know? And you can just tell that that's just somebody, like, with a spark thing, you know? Like, so even just a sparkler, for all I know, just dropping, you know, sparkles on her, and then they're all flying by her. You know, it's the same kind they use on, on the Enterprise when it's blowing up and stuff. You know, it's like, that was the simplicity of it. I also thought that maybe it was just the loneliness of it, you know? Much like the end of 2001. Uh, I don't know. They're all good. I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> so we, then we see her go back to save Reno. 
you know? And I wrote, we were so young. We had no idea what we were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> All our theories out the window. It's Captain Picard. No, it's not Captain Picard. It's Picard <laughs> <Burn> of himself. <laughs> um, although it is an interesting paradox, right? She knew to go back to signal to save Reno because they had already gone back to save Reno because of the signal. Right. Dun dun. Paradox. What time is it? Doesn't doesn't work the way we think it works. Doesn't work the way we live it. I guess not. Terralysium, uh They mentioned. Uh, Spock says something about like that's where they were going. Is that was yeah. that the goal? They're going 950 years in the future to go to Terra Elysium. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Also, a thought I had: uh, the dilithium crystal incubator that Poe made, that gives us the energy of a supernova, is still on board the Disco. So it's another thing that's taken out of canon continuity. It's like because obviously we can't have that. All of our crystals are dying. We need more crystals. Uh, all those storylines, plus they get to use it in the future. In, in, uh, on Are the you disco referring to our here. lithium circuits? Yes, the lithium circuits. My, <laughs> my apologies. So uh, we find out that signal six is Burnham showing the discovery its way through the wormhole. So that's number six. That's really cool. And uh, finally, we're at the room with the torpedo and it's Cornwell and Pike. And uh, they realize, of course, there's no other way. Someone has to sacrifice themselves, as you've stated, and you have to use the manual hatch lever. Pike says it should be him, but she points out that uh, he has a different future. And uh, he knows it because of the time crystal. But he says, that's how I know it won't go off if I'm in here. She's like, but what if you're wrong? And we've already seen Burnham at this point change a vision. He can't risk it. So Pike does his duty and says goodbye to Cornwell, and we lose another great... Um, Another great character, which leads us to something that uh, Katie Burt wrote at the Den of Geeks. She said, did Cornwell have to die? I mean, this is a one half-hearted aside, a poorly plotted attempt to raise the stakes that they were already satisfyingly raised. Cornwell never got the screen time she deserved, and it would have been cool to see her pop up in one of the other many Star Trek TV series in the works, particularly Section 31, or even some horrible Starfleet Academy movie or TV show that we never, I hope, get. <laughs> that's what she wrote. Well, that's a good any, point. I mean, any Star Trek better than no Star Trek. <laughs> fair, fair, fair. Uh, but that's a good point. I mean, it sucks that now we have, you know, another continuity thread to all of this, you know, disco stuff that would have been great with Cornwall, and now it's out the window. Which is if they were really scared of can canon. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I also... I, imagine if this happens, right? So at one point... Uh, Pike calls number one back up to the bridge, and when he shows up, he's like in in a spacesuit, right? <laughs> he's like, "All right, you go this way. I'm pulling the manual hatch, and I'm crawling out this hole in the ship. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later." <laughs> right? And then, like when it blows up, he's like jetting back to the rear of the ship. <laughs> you know, he <laughs> comes back in. <laughs> Amazing. But no, okay. No, probably not, no. It's 15 minutes. Someone could have put a suit on. Um, let's see. So as I pointed out, it seems like we lost a good, like, quarter of the hull here, of the of the saucer section. So first of all, what about these people who have died? Yep, right. Right there. So first of all, what about these people who have probably died in this section, right? I mean, maybe they were evacuated, but, like, you know... Starfleet is going to try and keep this whole thing hush-hush about what's happened, but what are they going to say about all these people who lost their families? And not only that, but people are definitely going to see at Space Dock, you know, a giant hole ripped into the Enterprise. What's that all about, people? He, anyway, it was a collision with, with a Romulan ship. Must have been something. Right, he, was, he took it out by just ramming it. Or he got a, it's a bite mark. <laughs> wow. Space amoeba. Yeah, you don't want to run into that thing. <laughs> Bite your head off, man. Spock is stuck. We find out that the torpedo that was fired near them knocked out the shuttle's shields and that he's not going to be make it. So he and Burnham have that perfect uh, heartfelt goodbye. Disabled. Discovery can lock onto you with a tractor beam. There is no time. 
And even if there were, they would need to lower their shields to bring me aboard, and they will not survive doing so. Not in this battle, not with the amount of damage that ship has already sustained. You must go. I just got you back. I don't want to let go. Neither. Do I. I already lost you once. You never lost me, Michael. As a child, I was truly lost. The path of my father. The path of my mother. You came into our lives, and you taught me it was possible to travel both. You found me. You saved me. That wasn't me. That was always in you. You are my balance. Michael, you always have been, and I am afraid that I will not find it again without you. Okay, listen to me. Listen to me, little brother. This is the last advice I'll ever be able to give you. It's kind of an important thing to, uh, to, to learn, learn here, here. It's, I, mean, I mean obviously that sets us up for you know Burnham's, Burnham's next line where she says reach out for another who seems the furthest from you Kurtzman actually Kurt said actually said you know that, you know, that she's talking she's about talking about Kirk in that, in that moment, moment right where she's clearly clearly that's, that's I, I, felt I felt that was talking, talking about McCoy McCoy seems further from him than Kirk does you know Kirk seems to be in the middle but McCoy seems ever further away further away from Spock from Spock so, so just, just to wrap, wrap things, things up, up Spock, Spock is rescued, is rescued by, the by the Enterprise. Tilly saves Tilly the day, saves the day by, blindfolded. Uh, blindfolded, right? right? We definitely need to promote Tilly. We definitely need uh, the disco follows the disco Burnham, follows and, they are gone. and they are gone. But it was fun there because they had when they're getting uh, into the wormhole, they do the next or the, or the motion picture, the motion picture wormhole yeah. effects, where wormhole like effects, the rainbow like faces and blah blah blah. That was that was amazing. So we get back to San Francisco. Uh, did you, did you notice, notice all the solar, solar panels, panels on the Golden, Golden Gate, Gate Bridge? Bridge? I thought, I thought, that, thought, that, that, was yeah, hilarious. thought that was hilarious. We see them all being debriefed. Uh, number one is particularly prickly. I love that. And also when they ask her her name, she's like, number one. <laughs> Which yeah. I thought was amazing. It's one of those goofy jokes, because obviously they, you know, they would say her name. Yes. And, you know, you also could have just cut it slightly differently, right? In, right. in which she had just given her name, or... He asks her name, but they cut to somebody else, and then they cut back, and he's like, uh, all right, thank you. <laughs> but instead, they give us the silly number one. So here's something I, I, I pulled from Trek Core, so that's going to talk about this. It says, when we're calling her to the bridge, Pike actually calls number one Una, which is said to be the character's surname in several of the Star Trek novels and comics of recent years. However, still other novels, and this sounds so much like something ridiculous out of Star Wars canon, the kind of thing I hate. That is, uh, however, still other novels have given her legal name as number one. And later in Such Sweet Sorrow, when she states her name for the official debriefing to be number one. Ultimately, we're not sure we're any closer to knowing what, what her real name is. So anyway, that's ridiculous. That's the kind of thing that shows up in Star Wars canon. I'm like, we couldn't have come up with a better explanation for this then. That's her name now. And let's see. Uh, Tyler Voke has made the hex had the section of 31 because he is uniquely suit suited to see the two well, sides. Of he's made a full issues. commander in it, right? Yes. So. So then we get to the big unnecessary cop out that you were talking about. This is something that I agree with you and I totally thought was stupid. The fact that we have to like everyone has to totally like not talk about anything that's happened in the past. We're just going to shut everybody down. I just like there are other I mean again there like we've said there there are other reasons that everyone could have not talked about anything that's happened but to have totally like no we don't know the discovery the discovery doesn't exist burnham any of the crew members none of them exist nobody exists we've never had a kelpian as, as a as a crew member we've never it's all ridiculous it is because you figure there's so much other stuff that's happened that again nobody nobody brought up yeah you know 
So we encounter ships like the Intrepid, right? What's its history? We don't know. Why? How can we not know? How come it hasn't been discussed endlessly? Well, because it hasn't come up. Right. Even though we've encountered the Intrepid. This is how we're finding out about it. Yeah, it's just like, oh, there it is. Yeah, I wonder how the Tholians got it. We're not going to answer that question. You know, we're just going to move on. And it's ridiculous. Although we, we, we do get the nice uh, Enterprise thing where they do actually go back and steal the Intrepid. Right. So here's a question. Spock saw the signals before they arrived. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the Red Angel showed him when he was younger. So there's that. But then everybody saw the signals. Remember? Right. How? How how did that happen? I mean, again, we don't need explanations for everything, but that's just weird. Because if she was the signal all the times, then how did we see that before? And then, along those same lines, how did Burnham create that seventh signal that let Spock know that she was okay from Terra Elysium 950 years in the future? So I think part of our problem may be these signals, if they're supposed to take pl place within the span of, like, how, how, how much time took place during this season? A was month, it, month and a, a half, month? it feels like. Feels yeah, like, yeah. Which, which means all you have to do is say, you know, sensors detected the signal over here, right? But then we haven't seen it over here because we're light years away from each other. <laughs> You're right. So the only... The only question would be, like, could the signals have, I don't know, this is this, this like, uh, you, so you've got the dimensions of space, right? And then if... Okay. That, that's, that doesn't really solve it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, does, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Unless so, she just jumps back in time, but then if she can jump back in time... Why can't we just do what Discovery did, you know, and bring the Discovery back? It's weird. Well, they don't want to bring the Discovery back. I mean... No, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They got rid of it on purpose. So at the end of this episode, we get Spock shaved and in uniform, as we had hoped. Yep. Remember, you and I discussed it. Uh, it looks great. What was you also know, funny... That end felt like it was setting up the... The Pike, the, the Pike series. Show. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You weren't the first person to mention that. I saw that in a bunch of the reviews as well. Also, I don't know if you noticed this, uh, and it's just a little thing, but there's always like this weird, like swirly black and white pattern that's on that's on the original Enterprise, and it's near where Spock hangs out with his viewfinder. They put it in this episode next to him when he sits down. I was yeah, like, oh, that's, that's from the original there. series. Yeah, that is so amazing. Yeah. Um, blah, blah, blah. All right, well, that's it. And then, you know, we kind of just know that they're in the Beta Quadrant, in Terra Elysium, and that's it. That's all we know. Dun, dun, dun. I felt like we got a lot of interaction on the Enterprise Bridge that was unnecessary in sense of, like, wrapping it up. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's what made it, it went on. For, like, there was banter and interaction and, like, expressions and looks and you're like this, they're setting up <laughs> i know and like a Spock show yeah and what a lot of people said that i was reading about is it felt like they weren't wrapping up discovery it felt like you right. know the end of a season of a uh, of yeah another show or, or like that's how you set up the other show right is that we're like we're now gonna make it feel like yep you know, we're picking up right where we left off that's exactly right all right, here's some of the stuff I read in some of the reviews. Uh, TrekMovie.com said this, The battle itself that flowed through this episode was an adrenaline rush and served well to keep you on the edge of your seat. This episode likely featured the longest-running battle in Star Trek history, filled with heroic moments for ships okay. and crew alike. Absolutely. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, never mind. Sorry, that was nothing. Never mind. Eggs, bacon, milk. Oh, that's, that's my laundry list. Never mind. My laundry list. Yeah, I don't know how I got on this page. It's so weird. <laughs> I get those were groceries, not laundry. Never mind. <laughs> oh, so uh, 
he's talking about uh, you know the erasing of of discovery from canon, basically, right? We're just right. It doesn't exist now. It never happened. Blah blah blah. And he says uh, the solution could surely be nitpicked, but it is probably better for fans of the show than truly erasing discovery from the prime universe, uh, like yesterday's Enterprise did with their pocket universe rewrite. Oh, I don't know. That was great. No, I liked yesterday's Enterprise too. It was just interesting that he brought that up. Yeah, we get Sela. Sweet. And then he asks his final his final line of the paragraph is, but the bigger question is perhaps is this entirely necessary? Which of course you have proven already today it is not. Also, the star date given at the end of this episode was 1201.7. Trekcore.com had this to say. Given how much of last week's runtime was dedicated to extended goodbyes and how much of part two spends on unnecessarily detailed flashbacks, these episodes probably could have worked better as a single leaner 80 minute block instead of two episodes drawn out to 113 minutes. Thought that was an interesting idea. Eh. I mean, I'm good. I'm good both ways. It was just an interesting thought. Then we we need another episode. What's that? So we need another episode. Well, and I, I, I don't think you'd be better off compressing all that stuff together. I think you need to have the one episode where you say goodbye and then you yeah. have the battle. So uh, IGN wrote this, which is interesting. There have been whispers that this had been the plan for Discovery, perhaps as far back as it debuted, that the Disco crew would be catapulted into a different period, of, uh, different periods of time, and now a version of that is happening, which is kind of great. If you remember... Uh, and, and when Discovery first started, they thought it might be an anthology show where it, right. every season was about a different time in the. Uh, um, so apparently, them getting catapulted in the future has always been kind of an idea that they've been playing with from the beginning. But the question IGN asks is: Michael did start the Klingon War after all. How do we erase that from history? Question mark. Yeah, I don't think they erased it from history. They just said that they all died in this accident. I guess. Right. What they're not supposed to talk about is the spore drive, the time crystal, uh-huh. the red angel, and the suit. The but mirror the, universe, the, fact, the that, <laughs> fact that there's another short show. I mean, there's like all these things that have been tied to Discovery that are just like, nope, on the hush hush. We're not talking about those anymore. It's it's true. I mean, but, you know, there's other kinds of, you know, things that are like that, mm-hmm. right? Where like lots of stuff gets, you know, like, that's how you end up with, you know, Area 51 type problems, right? right? Where the conspiracy theorists are all like, it's all discovery. <laughs> who stole, <Love> who, <laughs> who broke into the Watergate Hotel? The discovery crew. That's what right. were they looking for? Not uh, Democratic uh, Party, you know, papers. They were looking for time crystals that the Klingons had left behind. <laughs> Love it. And, you know, you've got this beautiful uh, DS9 episode where we find out that Area 51 was actually an incident where uh, Quark and his, and his family actually <laughs> land on Earth in <laughs> 1949 or whatever it was. Uh, I love those death. episodes. Birth, death, me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are funny. They, yeah, it is Area 51 that they end up in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Birth Death Movies has this to say. It's an interesting little plot question that he has. Obviously, we know the greater answer, the out-of-world answer for this, but the in-world answer we don't, which is despite the elimination of the Leland control, whatever, on board Discovery, no less, rendering the Section 31 fleet lifeless and the time travel mission now unnecessary, Michael still opens the wormhole and Discovery shoots through it. It's a pretty great sequence, as figures from around the battle gaze emotionally up at the ship vanishing in a big glowing space anus, and the crew aboard go wide-eyed as they travel 930 years into the future. But why did they have to go if Leland Control was already dead? So, in part, we get the in-world answer from Spock, right? Right. It's too dangerous. You know, other people will try to get a hold of it. Uh, You know, that's why it's got to be a secret. And that's why they have to go into the future. So, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's un, ultimately unsatisfying, right? <clears throat> I mean, you know, as we're going to see 
I don't know, 10, 15 episodes from now in the original series, Daystrom invents M5, right? Right. And he's basically doing the same thing, only it's simultaneously 10 years in the future and 60 years in the past. <laughs> I mean, if they were, if they were doing this, yeah. right, if, if Control could, like, basically run all of Starfleet and... 31 ships and all their little probes and, you know, all basically from Leland while he's running around. Yeah. Then you could have made M5 that actually properly ran the Enterprise without doing the crazy stuff it ends up doing. Yes. And why would you think Daystrom was so amazing coming up with M5 if they'd already done this other thing? An accident. Uh, Denik Geek had this to say, good old Kitty Bird said, some uh, some may have found the battle sequences too chaotic, especially by the time the Klingons and the Ba'ul Kelpians show up uh, to help the Enterprise and Discovery fight control. But she says, I was too busy reveling in the wonder of how this story managed to pull everything together in this final episode didn't notice. <laughs> I like that. And then the, the last thing I have and the last thing she wrote was, Wow, aside from some of the Borath stuff, I really did not like the Klingon stuff from this season. Or the last, if I'm honest. What? Which is funny for me because I loved last season's Klingon stuff, but did not so much love this season's Klingon stuff, which is interesting. Um, I don't know, how do you feel about the Klingon stuff? Uh, so this felt more normal Klingon, mm -hmm. right? Didn't feel quite so alien. Right. Uh, which... I like in the sense that it made me feel like, oh, this is all just Star Trek, right? Right. On, on the other hand, you know, one of the problems in Star Trek, which they occasionally lampshade by encountering the Sheliak, right? Or some guy who only speaks in, you know, epic poems. Uh-huh. Encountering... The aliens should be an alien type experience as opposed to right you know everyone's got a nose prosthetic and that basically makes them different the star trek way it is and i mean uh, well uh let's for talk. television you, know, you kind of have to do that but mm -hmm. I, I i do i did feel like the alien and the budget the and the... yeah right exactly i did feel like the alienness of the budget makes more logical sense even if it doesn't feel emotionally, you know, like this is Star Trek. Like, you know, so I could I could appreciate that part of it. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm getting the reading, I'm getting a poor connection all of a sudden, so let's wrap uh, it up. Yes, let's quickly wrap it up. Uh, just give a uh, general overall not general, but uh, just give overall thoughts season two and uh, maybe even compare it to season one. Well, of course we get one total arc right and this really did turn out to be super arky i mm -hmm. mean it didn't feel that way as you were getting in into it there was a little bit of feel of planet of the week oh we go to terlesia and we go to the you know kelpian home where we go over here but by yeah. the end you're like oh this was one solid story right this is yep. a tube of story there's no <laughs> digressions there's no yeah you know here we had this interesting off thing nope it's all perfectly put together Whereas we really got two stories in the original. We had the the war story yep. with uh, you know Lorca and all that stuff, and then you get um, you know kind of a you know it, it felt like you had these two different pieces, and then they were interesting, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't have to make it all one deal, but so that was different. Yeah, um, I mean, I've said this. I mean, I don't. I I kind of like the way that the last like four or five or six episodes have been of this season. Did not love so much the first half of this season. And uh, I don't think it was the episodic nature. I just, some of them were great and some of them were okay, blah, blah, blah. I guess I just love a good through line. I guess that's really uh, what it comes down to for me. I uh, really loved the second half of this season. Thought it was really great. Uh, but in comparison to the first season, you know, somebody, one of the reviewers pointed out that when it came to the first season, it was, it was less of an, of an overall arc to it, mm -hmm. I guess, you know? Uh, I mean, yeah, I know we got it split into the two halves of the things, which were 
which I guess those were kind of arky about, right? Like you put it into the first half and the second half. Sorry, I'm working this out as I'm talking about it all of a sudden. But uh, anyway, I don't know. I guess I guess there were just a lot more like surprises and a lot more like really cool stuff that was happening in the first season and the second half and the and the second season, which again I thought was great. I'm not putting it. I'm just comparing it to the first season. I think that maybe I still like the first season a little bit more. Uh, but that also could just have to do with because Lorca, you know, which could be just all it is. Yeah, obviously he's great. <laughs> yep. Have you seen uh, Death of Stalin? No, I haven't. Oh, it's it's very good. All right. So of course you've got uh, you know a fabulous cast. You've got a python. You've got, and then of course you get Lorca in there. It's... Yes. Nice. I've heard it's great. I've not I've not yet oh, seen it yet. It's quite good. I love it. All right. Well, that'll wrap up the fun of uh, season two of Discovery. We do start back next week with the uh, original series. So please tune in. Keep watching and listening for that. The episode we're doing, I suddenly can't remember for the third time in three weeks. And then... Uh, uh, we would know, and, but our, our lithium circuits have burnt yeah, out. Yeah. They've, they've, they've shut down my brain, so I have no idea what's going on anymore. <laughs> But, uh... The Changeling. It's The Changeling. I knew that. Silly me. So, uh, tune in next week, and we'll have The Changeling up on our feed. Back to the original series. It's gonna be exciting. But, uh, that's gonna be, uh, fun, so stick with us for that. I'm sure we're gonna hit Picard when, uh, that hits later this year. That's, uh, already started filming, by the way, if you haven't been keeping up with the news. So that's exciting. Uh, and maybe, uh, we'll even someday still get that Tarantino Star Trek movie. But uh, he's got to get get that movie he's doing this summer about uh, 69, 1969 Hollywood. So that'll be great. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll get some cool Tarantino Star Trek soon. That'll be fun. Uh, with that, my name is Matt from Austin and uh, Ken coming from Houston. Say goodbye, Ken. Live long and prosper. That's right. And we will see you all hopefully next week or next season. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs>